What is going on everyone? James Hancock here, back to talk about part 8 of season 3 of Twin Peaks, aka Twin Peaks The Return. And holy shit, there's a lot of interesting stuff to get to this evening. Quick word of warning, for whatever reason, my neighborhood is going berserk tonight. I've got helicopters flying overhead, I've got people partying next door, someone's laying off firecrackers. If you hear some random noises, it's just part of living in downtown Manhattan. There are a lot of people around here, and sometimes they like to get rowdy. In any case, where to even start with tonight's episode? Last week I talked about how part seven I thought was the strongest episode to date. I didn't expect at the time that it would only take one week for David Lynch to deliver an episode that completely obliterates all my expectations and horrified me and just kept me glued to the screen. I mean, I think it's fair to say at this point that David Lynch has arguably made the most disturbing retro 50s era black and white horror movie ever. I mean, I was completely floored. Prior to watching the episode, I came across a little line by David Lynch about advice on how to watch his show. And he said, I recommend getting whatever screen you're looking at as close to your eyes as you can get and use headphones, turn the lights down, and then you have a chance of getting into a new world. I didn't wear headphones, but I turned the lights down and I got as close to my TV screen as possible. And maybe this was the wrong episode to do that because I wasn't quite prepared for the intensity of the experience given what happened in part eight. Especially because after the previous episode where I failed to notice the cast change in that diner scene, I thought this time around I would pay extra special close attention to every little detail, almost like looking for little hidden Easter eggs and clues. And I don't know, this was an episode that was probably better just to sit 20 feet back from the screen and let it wash over me as opposed to being all up in it. In any case, I was totally blown away and let's dig into some of the reasons why. So we pick up where we left off with Evil Cooper, for lack of a better expression. I know some people get pissed off. They say, no, it's Doppelganger Cooper. Oh, no, it's Bob. I'm just saying Evil Cooper. You know which character I'm talking about. Evil Cooper and Ray Monroe are on the run. They're following a truck, taking down license plate information. And Ray keeps making a lot of these references to this piece of information that he has that he's memorized that Evil Cooper wants to know. But Ray is going to try and squeeze him for some money before he divulges the information. And I always feel like Lynch shows some of his best qualities as a filmmaker when he's following a car down a dark and lonely dirt road in the night with only the headlights to illuminate the path. It reminds me a lot of like Lost Highway and just the really, really dark, mysterious side of Twin Peaks when they're out in the woods. So I was totally sold from the word go as they drive down this dirt road, but they have a confrontation. They both pull guns. Cooper's gun has been switched with Ray's and Ray blows away Evil Cooper. And I thought that was gonna be the end of the scene and that we were gonna then transition to something else like the lovable antics of Dougie drinking coffee and putting his tie on his head. That was not meant to be. Because suddenly from the surrounding area, these dark, terrifying figures emerge. They're like apparitions or ghosts, whatever you want to call them. They kind of look like vagabonds, but they also have this completely like black and charcoal and really mysterious looking, a lot like the creature that we saw in the jail cell. We've been getting little hints and clues of these figures throughout the season, but all of a sudden we have a lot of them and they just descend upon the body of Evil Cooper, sort of wiping blood all over him and just, and Ray is, justifiably terrified. His, basically his emotions in the scene echo our own. We can barely even hear him react though because of all the strange audio that we have during this scene. But as they're wiping blood, and I, I didn't know if they were devouring him or ripping him apart or resurrecting him, I didn't know. But all of a sudden this giant like g gelatinous gooey sack or membrane is lying on Cooper's belly and we see Bob's face very clearly in it. But we also get all these creepy flashing white lights. I mean, Mulholland Drive, Lost Highway, and whenever Lynch is at his most terrifying, he does these great, uh, almost like strobe light effects. And there are a lot of those in this scene as well. So yeah, as my soul was being torn to shreds in absolute terror watching that scene, thankfully we then switched to the Roadhouse, AKA Bang Bang Bar, which is uh, my new favorite t-shirt. I know obviously it's the Roadhouse, so I'm called the Bang Bang Bar. I love the t-shirt. It wouldn't look the same if it just said the Roadhouse, but at the Roadhouse, they introduce Nine Inch Nails. I mean, Trent Reznor is one of Lynch's old friends and collaborators. Trent Reznor played a role in the soundtrack for Lost Highway. So it's highly appropriate that we're treated to essentially a Nine Inch Nails concert in the middle of this episode as a way of kind of cleansing our palate before further traumas are inflicted upon our imagination. 
but very cool show. I've never, I would never claim to be a giant Nine Inch Nails fan, but I am a giant Lost Highway fan. And for a long time, Trent Reznor's music from that was in my car on a loop on CD for a very, very long time after that movie came out. But even more ominous, when the song ends in the Roadhouse, immediately, <laughs> Evil Cooper sits up, sits up where we last saw him. So clearly, we're not done with them yet. So then the episode takes a sharp right turn into crazy, bananas, dark, mysterious, apocalyptic, doom and gloom, unlike anything I've ever seen. We go all the way back to 1945 in White Sands, New Mexico, and we actually get this stunningly beautiful shot of an atomic bomb test as we slowly push in. It's black and white cinematography, beautiful music. The bomb and the mushroom cloud look so mysterious, and we just keep pushing in and in and in. But as we get to the cloud, it becomes incredibly terrifying. We have screeching music, and it becomes really avant-garde, and it's a swirling of colors and debris. It's almost like we're either burrowing to the center of the planet or to the center of the universe. I mean, we are definitely on some sort of metaphysical plane here, almost like we're puncturing a hole in reality. And this scene just goes on and on and on. It's a lot like the famous trippy hallucinogenic sequence in 2001 where you're just going and going and going. And I was absolutely mesmerized. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, holy shit, here we are watching TV and David Lynch is giving us this wild, hallucinatory, insane, psychedelic adventure. And I kept wondering, like, is this the conception or the beginning of some evil force? Like, what's going on here? And then we see at a nearby convenience store this really eerie, almost stop motion photography, and we see those shadowy figures again moving around. And I think there, there are going to be a variety of interpretations initially before we learn more, but I almost felt like these were ghosts or apparitions of shadows of people who somehow died in the testing or were affected or died from radiation poisoning. I'm not quite sure yet, but the fact that they are kind of charcoal and gray does make me feel like there is a very clear logical connection between them and the use of the bomb. And amidst all this mystery, David Lynch doubles down on the mystery because we cut to this disembodied figure floating in this dark space as this disgusting goo starts to extend forth from the mouth of this faceless creature. And as the goo extends, it's covered in all these almost like tumors and bubbles. It's just foul, but of course, who do we see in one of those bubbles? Once again, the face of Bob. So I feel like this bomb somehow plays a role in the birth of Bob as we know him. We cut back inside the bomb and we continue to push and all of a sudden we're back in that giant purple ocean or wasteland that we saw a long time ago when Cooper was first trying to escape from the lodge or the waiting room of the lodge, however you want to interpret it. And it's just this absolutely magnificent shot of this vast ocean. It's just, this is like classic epic filmmaking as we drift across the ocean and we see this giant rock mountain with this beautiful fortress or tower on top and we just keep pushing it. I mean, after the horror and trauma of being inside a, an atomic explosion, this creates such a beautiful contrast. And we get inside and it's a woman listening to a Victrola and the giant strolls through essentially as this alarm goes off. And as he stops the alarm, he goes into this big screening room. Of course, David Lynch is a master filmmaker. Why not go into a giant screening room? And the giant is watching on the screen the atomic bomb going off, the convenience store footage, the gelatinous goo, disgusting shit coming out of that faceless creature. He's basically getting up to speed in all these events, and he starts to float up into the sky. And as he does so, lights pour forth from his mouth. And as these lights are pouring forth from his mouth, this sphere kind of frees itself and floats down to the woman's hand for a brief shining moment, the face of Laura Palmer in the sphere. And maybe I've just read too many comic books or seen too many science fiction movies, but it almost felt like they were creating the perfect hero with which to fight this emerging menace. It's almost like the Terminator was sent back in time, so you gotta send Kyle Reese back in time to fight him. In any case, she lets go of the sphere and it floats up to this image of the world and it becomes part of the black and white footage and descends down. So for now, at least it appears as if Laura Palmer and Bob were almost destined to be locked in this eternal struggle upon their initial conception. In terms of the years, it wouldn't necessarily make sense because Laura Palmer, I, mean, I guess she would have been a teen around the time of the beginning of, of uh, Twin Peaks, so she obviously wouldn't be born in the 1940s. But for now, at least, that's the way I was at least digesting some of the footage that we were seeing. As if what we have seen up to that point is not enough, 
David Lynch gives us an additional curveball as the episode shifts into the most kick-ass, badass, terrifying black and white horror movie perhaps ever made. Calendar speeds up to 1956. We're back in the New Mexico desert as this egg is hatching and this weird, like, frog slash snail slash fly hybrid hatches and it's got like frog legs but like a snail's head and these wings and it starts slithering across the desert in the moonlight so i was thoroughly repulsed and what i love about david lynch is he always has had this kind of 50s sensibility in a lot of ways he loves 50s cars he loves 50s music he loves 50s outfits and hairdos and every time you're watching something like blue velvet or mulholland drive or whatever the case might be he finds a way to inject some of that 50s sensibility into his stories and we get this perfectly innocent teenage romance that this boy and a girl are walking along and like picking up a penny and go, oh, penny, good luck. I mean, they are achingly innocent. But meanwhile, we have these ominous black silhouettes walking around the desert and taking shape. And they start to harass people on the highway and saying things like, got a light. But when they speak, it's like this electronic crackle, almost like they're made out of radiation and they are just so damn spooky. You don't want them getting anywhere near you, and they just start harassing this car with this old couple, and the couple very wisely careens out of there. But man, talk about a place where you don't want to be is anywhere near this desert at night. But back to the teens. They have a very sweet, innocent kiss goodnight, and they go their separate ways. And we get this great, beautiful sequence where we see how everybody in the town, from people working in the diner to working in a garage or just a teenage girl at home, they're all listening to the same radio station, all connected by the same song as one of these dark figure starts to walk through the city and approaches the radio station. And this is when David Lynch treats us to some truly horrific violence that's worthy of like an Italian horror maestro Lucio Fulci. He's very, very famous for having these supernatural zombie-like creatures essentially just reaching out and pulling out the back of your head. We get a bit of that in this scene as this figure walks into the radio station, approaches this beautiful woman, and just seizes hold of the top of her head and rips it to pieces. He goes into the DJ booth, does a similar thing, but he kind of holds on to the host for a while while he starts basically speaking some message on repeat over and over again. I wrote down some of it. I didn't get the entirety, but he keeps saying, this is the water, this is the well, and what I thought was drink full and descend. I thought that's what he said. I, I might have misunderstood exactly what he was saying, but he keeps saying it over and over and over again before he finally kills the DJ as well. And meanwhile, we see people passing out as they're listening to this. Obviously, it's having a huge impact. And the teenage girl that we saw earlier, we see her sleeping as the weird frog, snail, fly hybrid comes into her home. She opens her mouth and it crawls inside. And over the credits, we just get this shot of her sleeping. I'm still digesting, no pun intended, what we saw in this episode. Perhaps it would have been wise to wait 20 minutes and really let it sink in so I could try to make better sense of it. But I was just so overwhelmed by the emotions of this episode and the intensity of the imagery and the intensity of the mood and style and tone that I couldn't wait to dive on YouTube and start ranting and raving about my initial impressions. If anybody knows the connection between the testing of the atomic bombs to Twin Peaks lore. I'd love to hear more about that. It wouldn't surprise me if there are references in the past that I've either overlooked or not properly listened to that have a connection between Bob and the atomic bomb. But maybe this is all new ground. Perhaps it's a David Lynch just adding all sorts of new bricks and mortar to the lore of this incredible universe that he's created. And that's really what Lynch has done with this show. He has created another world, another universe for us to explore. And while we can have a lot of fun debating the significance of all the little details and all the little clues and all the interconnectivity. In the end, even if you do none of that, you're still gonna be spellbound by a show that is unlike anything else in the history of television. David Lynch has created an 18 hour cinematic epic on TV that is unlike any film or any show. And it wouldn't surprise me if at the end of the season people are saying, this is David Lynch's masterpiece. This is the finest work of his career because he's basically getting the opportunity to explore and experiment in so many different ways, so many different formats, so many different settings and environments. Very rarely do filmmakers have those kind of opportunities. It's absolutely fascinating to watch. I don't know what I'm gonna do with myself when the season draws to a close because as a film fanatic and as a David Lynch fan, what the hell show is gonna possibly match the excitement? I mean, obviously I'm looking forward to some shows coming out this fall and this summer like Game of Thrones and Star Trek. But when it comes to cinema and the art of cinema and pushing the boundaries and innovating 
and breaking new ground, there's nothing like this. <laughs> so it's gonna be very bittersweet when it draws to a close, but the beautiful thing will be going back through and watching the entire season. It wouldn't surprise me at all if people immediately start hosting 18 hour, once like one shot giant screenings at movie theaters where you watch the whole thing in one fell swoop. People will bring a pillow or they'll bring uppers or whatever and they'll just power through the whole thing. It almost wouldn't surprise me if this midnight movie phenomenon were to emerge where you walk in at midnight, you start watching Twin Peaks, and then you come out the following night while it's dark again. Like that would be a kick ass David Lynch Twin Peaks experience. I might even have to create a club devoted to that. But as you can tell from my voice, I am very, very excited about what I saw. I was blown away. My, easily my favorite episode of the season to date. I was terrified. I was fascinated. Cinema is all about emotion, and I felt nothing but overwhelming emotion throughout this. So thank you, David Lynch, for giving us another episode to debate and be excited about. Unfortunately, due to July 4th weekend coming up next weekend, we're actually skipping a week of Twin Peaks, and so it's going to be a little while before we get the next one. But that's fine, because what we saw tonight will give us plenty of material to discuss in the interim. But as always, I really appreciate you watching these videos. Please consider giving me a subscribe. If you want to talk more, you can find me on Twitter at Colbrax or just leave a comment in the comments below. I do my best to get to all of them. And I will see y'all in the very near future. Onwards and upwards.